and Apex Lab podcast. Hey there, welcome to the Level Up Engineering podcast, where we speak to the most experienced technology leaders from around the world. So stay with us to learn actionable management insights to take your engineering team to the next level. This show, this show is powered by Apex Lab, a team of experts in end-to-end digital product development. ApexLab.io Welcome everyone, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast. I am Karolina Tots, and I am really happy to have you here with us today. Today I have another amazing guest who has quite the experience in the software engineering industry. He also has a very interesting life background, I would say, and we can talk a little about that if you're open to it, Robert. Absolutely. So before we jump into today's topic, which is um, one of our open source stories, you are the CEO of Altinity and you have been playing around with databases since the 1980s, if I am not mistaken. And you also have quite the background in Japanese and Latin. So um, if you could give us a little bit about your journey in this life, I would, I would love that for our listeners and watchers. I, it would be a pleasure. And Carolina, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's it's uh, wonderful to be here. And uh, yeah, I, I followed a pretty long path. It started back in 1972 in junior high, where our science teacher decided that we should learn about programming. And so he got a an account on a local timesharing service. This is, uh, and, and with that account came a teletype, a very primitive typewriter and um, an acoustic modem so that you could, with a phone line, so that you could call up the service uh, and then you put the phone in the coupler so that the teletype was then connected by sound and could send the characters that it was typing. And that's how I learned to program. There was a little book on the shelf that said Introduction to Washtenaw Computing Services and the Basic Language, and you could just sign up for an hour. And uh, so I started. My first program was a geography quiz. And fast forward, uh, I actually started as a professional in the IT industry in about 1978 uh, as what was then called an operator. We would now call the sysadmin. I started working with databases in, uh, beginning in about 1982. And I've been, uh, over the last 41 years or so, uh, been working more or less continuously with data in one form or another, either working on database internals, uh, working on tools around them, or working on applications that run on them. So it's been a it's been a long journey, and uh, it's also involved a lot of startups as well as open source. I think um, if you could, because we are t- today going to talk about the the impact of open source software development. Um, if you could shed some light on what you do at Altinity and and how it's connected to open source, in your opinion, it would give context Certainly. to our listeners, yes. Right. And my job at, at Altinity is to run the business. But practically speaking, that means I am the link between the technology and the economics. So technology can do useful things, can solve useful problems, but you also have to ensure that it's tied to things that make economic sense for users. So, for example, that you're pricing it well, that you're solving uh, economically valuable uh, problems, and that you're also delivering software in a way that makes overall economic sense for uh, users. You can't give people software that's incredibly complicated and expensive and labor-intensive to run and expect to have people be successful. So my job is to balance those things. And uh, so it involves, you know, understanding the technology, but also in, involves understanding the business side of things and making sure that they mesh together smoothly. And how does that how does that come together within open source? Um, how did you get started with open source uh, development? That's a great question. So... Well, it's it's interesting because if you look at open source, open source started a long, long time ago. The first computer programs were open source. In fact, they remained that way for a long time. IBM, even in the in the days that that I was uh, first using learning how to use a computer, actually gave away their open their operating system. Uh, they charged for the hardware, but it had not really occurred to a lot of people that they could actually charge for the software that ran on it. That began to change in the late 60s, but 
when I first, uh, in some of my first jobs, uh, we used Fortran libraries like Linpack. Uh, these are used for, uh, uh, for doing, uh, uh, you know, various types of mathematical analyses on, uh, on matrices. And these are just free libraries. You could basically mail off to the people that wrote them and they would send you a tape with the software on it, which you would then mount and put on your computer. So, so I, I've been using this stuff right from the beginning, but Fast forward, where I really got involved in what's now modern open source was in 2006, I got a job working for a company called Continuant, and they were building high availability for MySQL. So MySQL is an open source database. It's licensed under GPL v2. It's incredibly popular, and it was on the on the rise then. And because we were in this market, we also had to learn uh, how to how to live in this market, and we ended up doing open source ourselves because that's just sort of a, it's really the simplest way to make headway in the market is you have open source users, they expect things to be, uh, you know, they, they expect things to be free to try out. So we ended up open sourcing our own software to do that. And so I've been involved with that that market and, uh, you know, working with developers uh, who use open source software since then. So it's now about, it's uh, now 17 years or so. And was it quite similar or was it quite different uh, when you first began to work with open source? Um, because I tend to think that uh, building communities is is kind of where um, general marketing is going, you know, like... Um, we were doing content marketing and then we were doing uh, videos and now it's it's all about building communities. But it seems that the open source community was, you know, active before building communities was a thing. That's an interesting question. So the big change between the early open source and the open source as we know it today, probably the single biggest change is the fact that we have global networks that allow people to uh, communicate with each other, specifically the World Wide Web. I, it's kind of hard for people who are in the industry now, it's, it's kind of hard to conceive of what it was like in the, um, in the, in the old days. So, for example, you, you couldn't just set up a Zoom call. It was, if you really wanted to communicate effectively with people, you actually had to go and meet with them physically. Moreover, if you wanted to transfer software, as I mentioned, you would write somebody a letter and say, I please, I would like a copy of your software. And they would actually put it on a physical tape, which was, you know, typically something you know, like a tape reel about this size, and they would ship it to you. So these were tremendous impediments to collaboration as well as sharing of, of the software itself. Fast forward, by uh, 1995 or so, the World Wide Web is beginning to become really prominent with browsers like Mosaic. And at that point, it was possible to have websites, for example, that would allow people to to talk to each other. Uh, these were very popular. Uh, there were news groups, for example. Those actually arose in the 80s. And then you had, uh, you know, websites where people could actually, uh, uh, you know, do shared messaging. Uh, and at that point, things really took off because people could collaborate together and they could also put the software in places where other people could download it easily. So that's those are the things that have really driven it. Beyond that, there have been some some major technical changes in how tech and how software is developed. A lot of them uh, driven by open source developers, and uh, so these are these are all things that have made made the picture completely different. Thank you so much. Um, could you shed some light on on um, your motives behind open source software development? Why why do you think open source advocacy um, is a is a positive impact and um, and how did you get around it in the first place? I have a a deep personal motivation because I've written a lot of code over the years and there's something really wonderful about being able to publish your code in a way that it will always be there and can never be taken away from you. So I worked on a uh, some software called a, a something called tungsten replicator, which was a piece of software that did the first parallel replication for sort of high speed replication uh, between MySQL databases. That's open source, so I'll always be able to find that code and look at it. And so there's this sort of pride of workmanship in this sense that you don't 
lose these important pieces of work, that's deeply satisfying. Beyond that, there are two reasons that businesses are very, I uh, really like open source and and why we pursue it. One is it's an incredibly effective way to develop software. So the if you look at and I think the the, the obvious example of this is the Linux operating system, which literally has thousands of contributors who work together and are able to contribute the code that makes Linux the the blockbuster blockbuster that it is today. Uh, the other thing is that the you know so you have the the, the technology um, the other thing is it just turns out to be incredibly powerful to be able to work with distributed groups uh, and and also to share through those share the software that you're working on so what you can do is you build software and you can immediately turn around and let people use it. There's no ba- there are no barriers. And they can give you immediate feedback. Because, yes, I like this. No, I don't. Sometimes the people that are building the software in open source are exactly the same ones that are, that are using it. So this solves the biggest single problem in software, which is to build something somebody wants. Open source has been one of the, the chief, uh, one of the key ways that, that, that we've come to solve this problem. Some people still... Um, feel a little bit itchy or icky about about uh, having open source software out in the world and using that for their own purposes what what do you usually say to them how do you mean icky in in terms of like you you release the software and then people can do anything they want with it is that is yes, that what you yes, mean? yes i I think that is an issue but you know, it's less an issue for, for for ordinary people who are just writing a piece of code. I think, you know, as a as a programmer, if somebody uses my stuff and thinks it's useful, I'm usually pretty ecstatic because that that feedback is sort of that's why we do it. Uh, at least for me, it's yeah, I get a salary and everything like that, but I would do this even if I weren't paid. So so that that feedback is huge, but. I think it becomes an issue with businesses. They, and, and one of the really fundamental conflicts in open source today is that businesses want to use the marketing part of open source. That's the sharing that allows you to get the software easily to a lot of people who might try it and then become customers. That's a really good thing. And every business, virtually every business likes that. What they don't like is that people could take that software and build competing businesses. And so... That's a conflict because the way that open source software is typically licensed, you can do anything you want with it. Uh, you can build a business. You can compete with the uh, the people that wrote it in the first place. And so, of course, businesses don't like they don't like that very much at all. So there's there's a real there's a real tension there, and uh, and it's not fully solved. In fact, it is uh, quite prominent. We see it quite prominently today in. Uh, a number of uh, in a number of industries and specific companies and part of the reason for that is that this model of developing and distributing software turns out to be so effective that it's attracted enormous venture capital interest it's a standard pattern for building mega companies um uh, cloudera was an example of they were uh, built around the hadoop system my sequel was was very successful these businesses go on to be sold for enormous amounts of money. So there's a huge economic interest behind these open source companies. And as a result, uh, th- that's making this, this conflict a lot more, a lot more prominent and, and a lot more personal for many people. Mm, how are you on the issue? I don't, I don't mean to be too personal with you, but... Um... No, it's a great question. And I think that one of the, you know, there's sort of, you know, you mentioned... I. I don't actually have a background in computer science. Um, I my background is is in classical studies, Japanese history, things like that. And one of the things you learn from reading Cicero, for example, is Cicero claims in his philosophy that there's there's never a conflict between your own interests and doing the right thing. And you read that and you think, well, that's not true. And uh, because actually, if you, you know, in many cases, it's not. But if you go back and think about what he was really getting at is if you shape things the right, if you shape the problem the right way, you can both do the right thing, but also do something that's in your own interest. And so in the same way, 
for companies that, that live on open source, you have to think ahead how you're going to make money. It's not enough simply to put a bunch of software, to put software out there, have it become ragingly popular, and then figure out how to make money. Because a really good chance, there's a really good chance that the only way you can make money for many types of software is to close it up again. Because that's the only way to force people to pay. As a result, you're doing what amounts to a rug pull. And where you're just pulling the, you know, taking away the software that other people are using and may actually have contributed to prominently. So my point of view is that, yeah, open source is wonderful. I believe in it deeply. And as a value, we want to allow our customers to use open source as effectively as possible. What that means is up front, we've always had to think about how to make money. What do we do? We run it in the cloud. We manage it. Um, outside of the cloud, and we also offer people support. We've had that business model right from the start. And so we were always, even from early on, we were always focused on on how do we make money and build a viable business and allow people to use this open source software. So I, I think that's the only way to do it. You have to think about these issues before they become problems, and then you can make a, then you can make a choice that is, you know, will allow you to build a strong company, but also upholds your values. It requires a lot of uh, strategic thinking, I would, I would imagine, based on what you said. It does. And, you know, one of the things about open source is it's really hard to get people to pay. And I think people don't like to, a lot of people don't like to, developers or, or, or people early on don't like to think about that. The fact is, because we're, we're huge fans of, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of open source. And I've worked on databases where open source is very, very popular. But there are uh, databases like Oracle, which is closed and ha- always has been, is incredibly, uh, incredibly expensive. Now, it, yeah, and and so we can say, oh, that's terrible. You know, Larry Ellison is 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 an evil person. But what Larry Ellison knows is that that software, that powerful software, if you don't give people access to it for free and just force them to pay, you will make a huge amount of money. And he and he's and he's right. If on the other hand, Oracle had had just open sourced it from the start, they wouldn't be the company that they are today. They they might they might be wealthy, but they would have to, had to do it a very different and more difficult way. And people, I think, don't always confront that reality. Plus, there's the reality that some software, no matter what you do, if it's open source, there simply isn't a way to make people pay enough to run a business. Databases are are easy because they're or much easier because they're vital to your business. Businesses can't function without them, but software that that, for example, runs the, um, you know, uh, for example, you know, you know, displays things on your screen. That's like a little tiny thing, and getting people to 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 pay the kind of money that's necessary to pay developers is incredibly hard. So, so that's the that, that's the conflict that people are seeing. So, in this sense. What what do you think could be the future of open source software development? Well, first of all, I think open source is going to change, and it, it is changing now. It's it's evolved over time, and a lot of it has to do with economics. So, we see a lot of companies now confronting this reality that hey, if I really want to be a highly profitable business like Oracle, and for many people, particularly people who've taken um, venture capital, that's what they need. To, they need to have businesses that are like that in order to to pay repay their investors to make the investment work out. Well, those businesses are going to have a hard time uh, being open source. Moreover, they are uh, what's making the problem particularly acute for many of these businesses is that it's no longer as easy to get. Uh, cheap VC funding as it used to be. So interest rates have gone up uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, most uh, VC funding has dried up uh, considerably. In fact, a lot of the VC, we still see enormous VC investments, but they're going to very specific areas like AI. So that means that all these other businesses have got to get real. And as a result, I think we're going to see a whole slew of uh, of uh, of companies Pulling, com- uh, pulling software away from open source or 
adopting licenses that are less open, that give you less freedom to do whatever you want with the software. And we see this with Terraform. Uh, we see this with MongoDB. We see this with Elasticsearch. This is very popular software. So I think we're going to, I think we're going to see an evolution in terms of what it means for software to be open source. And it's based on, hey, what can people afford to build and give away? So, so, so that's, you know, sort of a key thing that's happening. So if um, if I'm not mistaken, there is one um, license that um, has um, access to the software, the open source software, but um, it um, it doesn't let you use that piece of software to build something that could be a competitor to to what you right. have just seen. Right. Right. And that's a really important point because, they, and there's this huge debate going on in the in open source about about licensing. So most businesses, so the the open source licenses before people got the idea that that this uh, that open you know the original open source licenses were developed by people who wanted to share their software freely and not have people take the work away from them in the sense of not not have their own work be closed up and inaccessible to them. And, you know, sort of my, my basic motivation, I want to put my stuff out there. I want to be able to get at it. I don't want some company to just take it, close it, and then I can never see it again. And the open source company, uh, the original open source licenses were designed so that if you put software out there, um, people could, particularly viral licenses like the, the, the uh, uh, GPL, were designed so that you can use the software, but if you change it, you must give your changes back. And it's a very powerful model because it ensures the software will remain free, regardless of how it evolves. The um, and and so for a lot of people, that is the only form of license that's acceptable. But um, for the businesses that want to, and 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 the great thing about those licenses is they allow you to use it for any business purpose. You might write some software, and perhaps it's to run your, uh, you know, to run your business, you know, for a you know certain purpose. But I have a completely different uh, business. I take the software and I can use it however I want, um, and you don't have any claim on that other than the fact, you know, perhaps I have to I have to say that you know I have to, uh, you know, share the li- share the software and. Uh, you know, and publish the license. So, so that's great. But, you know, if we get into a situation where you're afraid that somebody's going to take your business away, it, then you have more restrictive licenses that say, hey, you can use the, the software for anything you want, but you can't build a business. I can't build a business that competes with yours. And that's, uh, there's actually a form of license, new form of license called business source license that does exactly that. Or it does, Things like say, hey, the software is closed for three years, but after or highly restricted for three years, and then it reverts to a, a normal, you know, much more permissive license. So these are, you know, these are things that are are going on. I think for, I I think it's not really clear how this is going to evolve because these changes are good for the businesses that that write the software, but they're not so good for the businesses that use it. And the businesses that use it, they like open source because it gives them access to very rapidly evolving technology, but it it doesn't restrict what they can do with it. And they know that they won't be visited by somebody's, you know, salespeople to say, hey, you owe us money. So that control is something they value. So so I think there's a tension there that it's it's not obvious how this is going to going to work out and there'll be a lot of arguing about it over the over the next few years. It seems as though there are lots of different forces at play here, you know, because you mentioned the open source yes. um, software developers have a different set of values or perspectives uh, than the business entities. And within the business, there is the businesses who develop the software and there is the businesses who use the software. Um, yes. Could you... Could you um, elaborate a little more in, on this um, on this open source map of uh, who the key players are. Yeah, well, let me give you uh, let me tell you a story that I think has uh, you know has those components. So my last company was a company called Continuant, and um, we sold it to VMware, who uh, is an, it's a really big um, software famous for their virtualization uh, and very prominent in in the in the software industry so as the last part of the sale we had to come in and meet the ceo of vmware uh pat gelsinger 
and who's really famous. He now runs Intel. And uh, so we, they, there were three of us. We were led into his office and we sat down and Pat started talking to us. I think part of it was just to make sure that, that he approved of us as human beings. Uh, and so he was, you know, making small talk and just making sure we were normal and weren't going to cause trouble. But then the second part was, you know, as we were looking around, because Pat had been, you know, very prominent at Intel. And we we're looking, he had all these plaques on the wall, all the Intel chips he had worked on. And so we're kind of staring at these. Meanwhile, Pat launches into this speech about how Intel, or VMware is not an open source cu- uh, company. And at the time, VMware was a, <clears throat> was a, a very, very big on proprietary software. It had huge uh, a set of patents that protected their software and, and the technology around it. And he wanted to make sure that we were crystal clear that none of that was going to be given away. And we said, of course, because he was about to write us a check, we said, yes, sir, and, and we left. Well, fast forward three years later, uh, VMware became a major contributor to open source software. They not they used it, they had used it quite heavily, but then they began to, they made a major investment to develop open source software to make it possible for anybody within VMware within an hour or two to get approval to release software uh, for their personal projects and and um, and even uh, corporate projects uh, because they realized how important open source software was uh, was for their business and for their users. And there were two things that that drove that. And I think these are get to your question about how uh, you know what are the forces at work here? One, their customers had major commitments to open source. They needed to get this this rapidly evolving software, and they needed to get e- get it easily. If VMware wasn't in the open source, producing open source, they couldn't fit in with the development models that these customers were using. So that was thing number one. Thing number two was open source is also a support a, a source of disruptive technology, and there's a technology for running for virtualizing. Um, computers called OpenStack, which evolved um, originally at NASA and then became quite popular. And open source, it it, it threatened to actually completely capsize uh, VMware's business because they were doing the same thing, but using proprietary software. Here was OpenStack. It was free. Why would somebody buy VMware? And so they realized that if they weren't involved in open source, they would not be see these technologies arise and be able to react to them and incorporate them into their business. And so for those reasons, uh, businesses are con- and are going to continue to be deeply involved in open source. The development models, the development model for open source is pervasive. This is something we haven't talked about, but one of the things that open source did is because people aren't in the same place, people uh, – uh, you know, like the Linux uh, team and many others developed ways to develop, uh, you know, to, to create software and manage it with people who are spread out all over the world. This is one of the reasons why we can have development groups in businesses that are in multiple geographic uh, locations. This is the open source development method. So people are deeply invested in this. And uh, so open source will continue to thrive. What's going to happen, though, is people are balancing if my business is based on open source, can I afford to give it away? If my business is using open source, what do I? What am I willing to contribute to maintain this? You know, so that so that it's secure. And also, as a business on both sides, how much of this software can I afford to have free? How much can I afford to have? Uh, you know, have it be be closed. These are very very basic problems that that every business, every technical business, is struggling with. So if um, there is a theoretical um, startup CEO um, who is who is thinking about using open source software, um, based on what you just said, I think uh, there is a lot of introspection needed before the company is ever built to make sure that it's going to be you know beneficial for everyone. You want to think hard about it. And there's. A, let me give you an example of another really tough issue that, that nobody really has a solution for in open source, and that's security. So you're using, like in our case, we're using uh, the database that we work on, ClickHouse, uh, actually has a small core, but, they, you know, sort of 
tens of thousands of lines that are the core of the software, but it has a lot of other software that it interacts with. So as a result, when you look at when you look at the software as a whole, there are millions of lines of code that we depend on that to function correctly. All of it open source. So who ensures that all of that code is secure? Like if some if somebody wants to attack people's data, they could go and um, you know and, and change libraries. This happens in open you know in front end software the stuff that runs in your browser there's similar these these huge libraries of software but very little control over who is changing them and what kind of changes they're making so um and by that i mean very little central oversight where somebody is saying oh yeah that looks like a good change it looks like a bad change it's up to the individual projects and some of the projects are just one person so this is a this is an issue that uh you know we get society as a whole receives huge, huge benefits from from software. You wouldn't be able to use the web the way that we are doing it right now with the software that's running on our browsers without open source. This, what The software that's running in our browsers and running the backends, a large percentage of it, without doubt, is open source. But at the same time, there are these problems that I've talked about with licensing. There are these questions about security. And so where we have this balance we're kind of on this knife edge and we'll continue to to you know to go back and forth as we adjust to new you know to 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 you know to changes in business environment to changes in technology to figure out what's the right level of openness what kind of licenses uh, do we use how uh, you know what parts of the business can we afford to have uh, be proprietary and so on and so forth so it's going to be I, I hate boring jobs this is going to be fun. It's going to be, it's constant decisions, constant thinking, and and I don't think I don't think that's going to change ever, because these forces are in tension with each other, and there no no force will dominate all the others. Absolutely, I think I think part of the reason why we are talking about this is that in today's world, it's um, we are kind of primed to these um, dichotomies, you know, like something is good for you, something is bad for you, and you need to make a decision. And um, if you make the wrong decision, then all those people are going to be out of your life because they have made a different decision. And based on what you're saying, there is a lot of different responsibilities of of these players within the open source community. Yeah, there's a lot of shades of gray. And I think that everybody has to, and I think that, and and what's really interesting is that, you know, we live in times where our societies are becoming very polarized. What I find interesting and actually really gratifying is that we still see, even though, for example, the United States and China are, you know, sort of increasingly competing with each other, um, even though we have, you know, various wars going on around the around the world, we actually still have people from all of those countries that are involved in these that are involved in these geopolitical conflicts still collaborating to create open source software. This is something I really like about what we're doing because I think open source software, I believe, is one of the ways that that we bring out the best in humans where we work together to solve problems instead of tearing each other down. It really, and I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, sort of a, you know, I, I run a business, I have to be realistic about things, but this is true. This this is an example of how humans can collaborate to solve very big problems. And so I think the open source development model, the notion of sharing, being open about problems, giving away you know, as much of the solution as you can to others so that they can build new and creative things. This is a very f- powerful method of solving some incredibly hard problems that our world faces. So I'm, I, I, uh, you know, for me personally, I think it's really important to be part of this movement uh, because I think this is one of the tools we have to solve some really tough problems and and basically make the world a better place, you know, for our kids, for their, for our grandkids, so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a really big deal to be part of this. I uh, love how you put that. Um, and, and continuing on with that train of thought, what are, because it's nice to be listening to you 
being on on this end of the of the spectrum if there is an end to the spectrum at all but but what can you share with us about what the trends are in the open source community i think the trend right now is for a lot of large and valuable pieces of software to become closed more closed over time that's clearly and that's driven by some basic economics um Uh, something as simple as interest rate changes. So you think about, okay, you know, five years ago, if you needed to buy a house in the United States, you'd pay two, three percent. On a loan, it's now six or seven. Why is that important? Well, it actually makes money, makes makes it harder for businesses to raise money, and it affects the the prices that people get for venture funding. So you can't afford to just, you know, if you get a hundred million dollars in You know, whereas previously you might have gotten $100 million dollars in investment and you could just uh, develop a bunch of open source software and worry about how to make money later, now you get 10. And uh, so you have to be worried right from the start. That means a lot of the big open source projects will not, you know, we won't see as many of them. Second thing is the ones that are out there, they now need to think really hard about how they're going to make enough money. So they're going to, and a lot of them will end up changing their licenses. And there will be a new reality uh about them. I think also with and I I don't want this to come out wrong, but I think it's I, I think we'll also see over time more security issues. Um it, you know, this is you know, just having this much software out in the out in the, the world and used for you know for as many valuable things and at the same time you have sort of these geopolitical conflicts at some point these things have already co- uh, collided and you know because people now have the motivation to try and hack soft this this software as, and it, and most importantly it's governments that have the the motivation to do this so i think we'll see you know come to have some new understanding about that i do think that the things that won't change is the the idea of being open in software development developing in distributed teams uh giving software to your users so that you can find out letting your you know how what their needs are and how they react to it letting your users contribute to the software those are here to stay those those will not change because it's just this is a better way of developing software and 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 the proof is in the pudding it is more productive it creates software that's more useful to um to more people. And as I said, going back to the fundamental problem of software is build something that somebody needs. This is open source solves this problem. So it's that's not going to change. But we'll see a lot of arguing and a lot of sound and light and a lot of really smart people disagreeing with each other. That's we'll definitely have arguments. That I predict and we've always had them and they will continue uh, you know for as long as people are developing software. Circling back a little bit to to the security issues and to to the questions that might arise um i am not a developer myself uh i studied programming in the language c in college but um i i wasn't a fan enough to to go down on that on that route uh, but i quite enjoyed the the different way of thinking that it it helped me acquire and so Is there something that the open source community can do to prepare for those questions to to kind of shield or or future proof the open source software that is being released? Well, I think this this is something that people are really struggling with because so here's a concrete example of the problem in the open you know the front end libraries that the, in other words the libraries that drive the software that you and I are using right now to talk uh, with each other it runs in our browsers. These libraries are huge. They often have software is delivered in packages um, using these are in uh, languages like JavaScript runs in the browser or Node, which runs in the back end. Um, these are very these these little packages are you know often developed by a single person or a small number of people and then they get pulled in to build the entire um you know sort of the entire software stack that runs in your browser so there's it's really hard to control what individual people are doing and to look carefully at the, at all of them i think some of the solution it's just like so here's the problem with security uh, let me actually frame it in a simpler way it's just like getting people to buy software if you give it away free they're not going to pay for it so that's and that's the fundamental problem that open source companies have people won't pay for stuff if they can get it for free or they'll pay it they'll pay a lot less with security 
people won't fix stuff until there's a cost. So if I can, you know, have a major security breach and share all your data and all your friends' data and it doesn't cost me anything, what possible motivation do I have to fix it? I'd rather just, uh, other than being a, you know, like a good person, but that only goes so far. So the solution on security is probably legal changes. And to make, and this is slowly happening. Where if I deliver software, for example, that has it, it has serious bugs in it, I could be sued by, uh, you know, by my users, especially if I'm, you know, negligent, and you know, don't try and protect my users. That's the kind of thing that will force me to look hard at these problems and and uh, ensure they don't come up in the first place. So I think that this is where society as a whole needs to create laws, to create guardrails in the in the use of this technology. And the simplest way is usually to make, to do something where if you don't handle the security, it costs you more. And then let the companies decide, okay, how much, how, how much of a risk am I willing to take that I'll screw up, somebody will hit a bad bug in my software, and then they'll sue me for a million dollars. I, so I think that's how it's going to get solved. It won't be I, there isn't a techni- an easy technical fix to this. There are technologies that can scan it, but they're expensive and they take time and labor uh, to apply. Until we're forced to do it, um, it, it won't it, it won't be uh, solved pervasively. It even almost sounds like you have to make it economically beneficial for companies. Yes. Yeah. And and this is this is actually one of the real kind. This is actually one of the places where open source forces collide because there are some people who do it because they think it's fundamentally good, and they don't believe there should be any laws uh, whatsoever controlling what they do. And then there are other people who see open source as a purely economic mechanism to develop software and to market it to their users. I'm kind of in the middle. I think it's good, but I also. I also uh, view it economically, and so I think it's really, you know, it's it's really important. The these are this this stuff is is so important and so pervasive in our lives that this is where society itself does need to make choices about how this software is used, and to try and shape the responsibilities of uh, you know of the people who generate this software and sell it. Uh, that that I think is is essential, and. Uh, but it's hard. It, it's it's really hard to figure. We're seeing this with AI right now. People are talking about regulating AI, and uh, they can't. We can't even agree what it is we're regulating. <laughs> you know, so that that makes it hard to pass sensible laws. The most likely laws in that case will be something that we'll discover later on are just terrible. But we won't know that, <laughs> so because we don't understand the problem very well. Going back to Cicero. And, yes. and what you said in the beginning about, you know, framing the problem in such a way that um, you you can't really make a choice that's not beneficial for you and the greater good. Yes. In that sense, I am, I'm thinking we need to develop systems that create such an environment where the decisions that are good for us are also good for the greater good. And yes. what you just said made me think about how it might be the individual who uses the software that needs to consciously think about the impact of their usage, like which software they are going to use and how they are going to use it. Yeah, and and actually there's a really important societal mechanism that has arisen to help people make those choices for open source software. It's called Foundations. So you can have software that's owned by owned and developed by a single company. And as long as that's the case, it, even if it's open source software, you never know whether it's going to remain open source. Because that company could, like a new manager could come in, or they could, you know, hit hard times. And then then a person, you know, as a person running a business, you know, okay, we're not making enough money. I'm going to have to lay people off. Should I lay people off or should I raise prices? That's a real moral choice, actually. Uh, the not just it's not simply a business choice. So one of the ways that that you can avoid getting in that position in the first place is to put your software into a foundation. And for Linux, for example, Linux is not owned by anyone. It's uh, or by any uh, single company. It's the property of the Linux Foundation. And that has been incredibly successful because it means that companies can, 
you know, companies can all contribute to it. They can build products that are based on Linux, but Linux itself is open and free to everyone. And so uh, one of the things that that we are hoping is that the software, much of the software that we work on will eventually be in foundations. We're happy to put parts of our software uh, in because this protects users, but it also makes that choice early on because you're saying, I am not going to raise prices. So now, like security, you know, uh, like other problems, it forces me up front to think about how, my, how I'm going to actually make money and deliver value to customers. I can't get away from it. I have to think about it because I've already closed it off. And a lot of, a lot of companies are, do this. There's Apache Foundation has an enormous number of projects. The a Cloud Native Computing Foundation has an enormous uh, number of projects for uh, what's called Cloud Native Software, Kubernetes. And then the Linux Foundation has a whole list of projects beyond Linux. This is a very powerful model. And I think that, you know, if you put your software into a foundation, you're making a statement. I'm putting it out there for common good, and I am willing to then compete freely on that software, deliver value to customers. And you're also making a choice that there could be multiple people. You're also making a choice for for customers there. You're giving them freedom in two ways. One, that they can access the software. But the second one, which is really important, is that there may be multiple vendors using that software and offering value to to customers. So you, you're actually giving them a guarantee of a free market. These are very, very basic ideas. And so this is why I like open source. I'm a huge fan. I, I love how you put that because it just makes me think about how there are different layers to the problem. And when you like shed light on what a foundation can give to someone, then then we can actually think about our choices and and not just think, you know, like a foundation is not really um it's not really a free thing, you know, because because it's not a yeah. single entity who owns it, but it is right. creating a free air market. Yeah, it is. It, and it's not perfect. Uh, foundations involve, you know, introduce bureaucracy. Uh, some people, the found, foundations have their own politics. They, uh, they make things slower. They make things, uh, you know, you have to deal with a, a bunch of people who maybe are not software developers, but are experts at, at being in foundations and like working there. So there's, there's trade-offs to it. Foundations are also expensive. They, you know, you, in, the, in the United States, like the Linux Foundation, Every time a project is added to the Linux Foundation, they set up a little company in Delaware to control it. This costs money. You have to pay lawyers. You have to, you, you know, you have to pay administrators. So it's not the right model for every software, but but for important pieces of software that that are important to society, it's a good model, particularly if you have a software creators who are willing to to grant it freely. Then I think that's the best of the best of all worlds, and I do think that will grow because I think that's the that's the solution for, you know, for making sure the software is free and, 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 and also properly managed for the benefit of its users. Could you tell us a little bit about ClickHouse and how you um, integrate the ideas that we talked about? Yes. Yeah. So we're, and just to be clear, so ClickHouse was originally developed by Yandex, which was a, a company, a Russian company in, in Moscow. They sometimes, they used to be called the Russian Google. It's a very good technology company. And they developed it to solve uh, problems in-house, uh, specifically to be able to ask arbitrary questions on very, very large volumes of data, like trillions of rows uh, of, of data, and to quickly say, hey, what's the average value for What's the average time on page uh, that somebody spent for, you know, this website? And to be able to just answer that in seconds. And uh, so they open sourced it in 2016. At that point, shortly thereafter, our fa our main founder, who's uh, uh, tried it out for an application he was working on, it was great. He said, okay, we need a, this is great open source software. We need to help people use it. <clears throat> so that's what we do. We basically help people run ClickHouse anywhere that uh, that they need to. They could run it in everything. It literally will run in an Android phone. I've actually seen a demo of that to clusters. Like our, our largest customer has about 900 servers running in the cloud, um, all containing ClickHouse. And solving this problem of processing 
data that's arriving very quickly in very large volumes and where people want quick answers. What do we do? So we contribute to ClickHouse itself. We've done um, hundreds of, of pull requests. We support a lot of the software that makes ClickHouse run well. So for example, Kubernetes is a very common platform for uh, for running uh, databases. We wrote what's called the operator that enables ClickHouse uh, to run there and released it in open source. It's used by thousands of people. Um, <clears throat> we build a cloud service so that if people don't want to run it themselves, they come to our cloud, uh, they pay us you know, based on how big their servers are, and we run it for them. And then we give them advice about, you know, if they want to run it themselves, we tell them how to do it and give them advice, uh, you know, when they're building applications as well as when something goes wrong. So that's that's what we do. So the base of the software is is open source. And in fact, our commitment is that anything that is, you know, doing the actual analytic processing, like doing web analytics or uh, it's very popular for looking, you know, for watching for security events. All that stuff is open source. But the stuff that manages it and the services that help you manage it, we charge for. So that's our economic model. But we also contribute as much as we can to the open source software. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Um, does that mean that you figured out how you can find the right balance between uh, making it economically beneficial and also making it a good open source project? Yeah, I think this. I think it is a good balance. We're further along than many companies are, and a big reason was we start when we started. We had to make money from day one, so uh, we were forced. We didn't own the project. We couldn't. It. We have taken a little bit of VC funding, but. Uh, but in general, we've run as a bootstrap company, so we've been forced to think about how to pay people, and we don't hi- we don't hire an excessive number of people. We don't we try not to do crazy things, and we try to think really hard about what it is we do that offers value to customers, so that um, you know, so that they'll want to buy from us and and make us successful. And that works both ways. You know, we get paid, but they also get something valuable, and that's partly by by not dominating the software that forces us to adopt that model and I think that's healthy for everybody. Right, right. Could you share a little bit about what um, might be in store for you for the future? I absolutely. So I think one of the things that's really important in, in our industry, so we help people run ClickHouse and we've always been very focused on that. But in fact, if you look at, so data is particularly what uh, what we call real-time data, very rapidly arriving information is now critical to many businesses worldwide. Simple example, security. We talked about this. Uh, it, you know, if something is, if one of your computers is, is being attacked, you want to know now and you want to find out what's going on and you want to fix it. So, that's data. The systems that monitor that it, have events arriving at tens of millions per second because they're scanning computers worldwide for many, many customers. So uh, our focus is enabling that, to, uh, those types of applications to be built. And so as a result, we're reaching out, we're, we're working on, on ClickHouse, of course, which is the core, but we're reaching out and figuring out ways using open source and a, and you know, and both open source software and open source development techniques to allow people to build the entire application. So you can have the database, but that's not enough. You also need to monitor it. You need to feed data to it. You need to get data out. All of that should be done with open source software. And we are uh, developing and delivering ways to, to help people do that quickly without having to, for example, solve the same problems again and again and again. So that's that's a big that's a, a big path for us and a really important one. Sounds um, like a really exciting uh, journey um, that you are on. Um, it's it's not boring. Let's put it that way. <laughs> if, <laughs> it's stressful, but ne- but it's never it's it's stressful because running you know like startups are always stressful. They're always up and down. One day you think you're doing great, you're top of the world, and the other and the next day it's like, oh my god, we just had a bug, <laughs> we're dying. So, but yeah, it's it's really fun and uh, it's it's never boring. And and for those of us that don't like, for those of us that like problems where it's not obvious how you're going to solve them, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful job. For sure, for sure. And um, today, our conversation we we touched on a lot of things. Um, you know, like the legal issues, the eco- economic issues, the issues with collaboration or the lack of the issues with collaboration, even in the current geopolitical um, 
area or atmosphere. Um, so it really seems like open source is like a little world within the world when it comes to how people operate amongst each other when everybody has different kinds of drives and motivations. And and it seems like there are a lot of things that everybody has to think about before they choose one software over another or before they choose one license for their software over another. Um, what do you think are some of the some of the opportunities and challenges for the people who are listening to us um what do you wish for them to to think about after listening to our conversation i think that everybody should be who develops software should think about a couple of things one is first of all how can i learn from open soft open source software and use these these techniques are very powerful so uh, there are things like infrastructure as code, uh, what we call GitOps, um, the the ability to do shared, you know, to run distributed projects efficiently. These are techniques that just should be basic to every to everybody who develops software, and they should understand how to apply them in their business. I think the second thing is you want to think really hard about the software you're using, where you're where it's coming from, and what would happen if that software goes away. I'll give you a simple example. We use Zendesk for, uh, uh, you know, for uh, processing uh, support cases, and we got a letter from them a while back that said, "Hey, you're in a, you're a company, and by the way, we see your address is in a company in a country we don't like. We're going to cut you off. You have 30 days." Wow. And we were felt, and and what happened was it turned out that the the when we originally registered, uh, the the address was in a place that we had no idea where it came from. Um, and we had changed our billing address. We're an American company. Um, and so it was just, it was, you know, it got settled. But the point is that if you're using proprietary software or you're using software that is licensed in a way that that isn't free, that software can be taken away from you. And you want to think about, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean for my business if it happens? Open source gives you choices. It gives you the ability to move somewhere else and to do the same thing. You can run it yourself. You can have another person run it for you. It also means that you're, it also gives you a stronger guarantee that there'll actually be a market which will keep the prices reasonable. So I think that, you know, as a manager and as, you know, as a leader in engineering, that's something you want to think about really hard and not just sort of blindly reach to the, you know, the quickest or the easiest, uh, Solution. I mean, sometimes it's really great to have quick solutions are good. You get to market fast, but you also want to think about these issues really hard. They're, they're, they're critical to your business. For sure. For sure. And so where do you think they can, they can um, turn to if they are thinking about these things? Uh, who would be someone to consult? Actually, you, you know, your own developers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, sort of developers understand these issues and because they work with open source software. I think that um, it, that what I would do is, you know, if I were just new to this, I'd go to open source conferences. They're really inspiring. Um, for example, KubeCon is one of the biggest open source uh, conferences in of the year. That's next week in Chicago. It's all the open source software devoted to all the open source software around Kubernetes. You can learn for that from that. You meet people who are using it. You learn about the things that they're doing it with. This is a great way to come up to speed, not just with what the software can do, but what what kinds what are the possibilities for building things creatively on top of it and understand how to use it use it effectively thank you 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 shared a lot of things about uh, and you were so very and politically correct, I feel, in, in the things that you have shared, you know, about all the questions and all the possibilities that are that are in this um, arena of, of choices. Um, I would like to ask you, if you don't mind, personally, like, what do you hope for to happen in this arena of open source software development? Yeah, that's a really good question. I want it to remain free and uh, and I want it to be accessible to anybody who 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 wants to use this software it's a yeah it's i it doesn't solve every problem in the world but i think that simply by maintaining this freedom 
we give people the possibility of creating things and solving problems that we cannot conceive of now. As I say, give people that give my kids, give my children's kids, uh, give them the possibility and, and other people's children, give them the possibility of solving problems and, and doing things that we cannot conceive of now. That's what I want. And that's also why I think open source is important. It's one of a number of things that, that will allow them that freedom and, and allow them to solve problems that, that are important to them. Thank you. Thank I you. Hope that, I hope that wasn't too muddy, but that's. No, I, I just had a, I, my first grandkid arrived a few months ago. And congratulations. So I, I think about that more now. <laughs> congratulations. I think it was very beautifully put. And also, you know, because when I feel like when people think about, you know, open source software, they don't put as much forethought into it. Um, and and when you frame it the way you just framed it, it gives um, the entire open source question and possibility a little more weight. It does. It it is, and I think it's you know it's not just I yeah you want to think about the whole thing. Not everybody does, and that's their freedom. They don't have to, but I think some number of us should. And I think leaders of large companies like Pat Gelsinger, who I think. You know, he would freely admit that they at VMware that they realized this was really important. Uh, they had not thought about it before. And to his credit, once he realized the problem and understood how important was it, it was, he did something about it. And he changed the way VMware approaches uh, approaches open source. That kind of that kind of action is good. and i I think he deserves all the credit that he can get for that. the um, you know, I'm I'm proud to have been uh, working at the company during that time. For sure, for sure. Thank you for for sharing that story. I think it was very eye opening. Um, as we are approaching the end of our time, just very quickly, the things that remain with me after our conversation are are that we each have a personal responsibility for the choices that we make uh, when we use software that is presented to us or or when we don't use software that is presented to us and um and just this story that you have shared with us i think um shed some light on the value in thinking about your choices and then maybe changing your route when you get new information about what's happening in the world. I think that's a very important lesson that um, is sometimes missing from from today's discussion of not just open source it software. Is. But. And I'll give you a completely concrete example. When, if you need to make a, you know, and, and not everything's a moral choice. I mean, stuff, we, we do stuff day to day, but there's certain things that, if you want to make choices that you'll be happy with and and sort of can live with, you know, decades later you look back and you think, "Hey, I did a good thing." It's important to to set things up so you make those choices early. It is very difficult to make a reasoned choice when somebody is dangling, say, a hundred million dollars in front of you. And software money is money talks in software. So sometimes you have to make and and as a result, you know, when somebody says, "Hey, I'm going to give you a, a you know a hundred million dollars if you just do this one thing," even if you dislike it, you're going to look at the money and you're going to look at it, you know, like how you feel about it and how other people will feel about you after you do it. And you might take the money. In fact, you probably will. So you need to set those choices up a long time in advance when you can actually make a reason choice, uh, you can't always do this. And, you know, a lot of things just, just happen. But I, I do think it's important to, again, as leaders to, to think about this, because I, I think there's a, a huge fallacy in, in, that's been dominant in particularly in American business that all you think about is making money and making money specifically for your investors. That's a new thing. The people who ran the first you know the great startups in in Silicon Valley, like Intel, like HP, they didn't have that attitude. They viewed their role as yes, build a successful business, but also think about the society that made it possible. And they gave back in a big way. Uh, people like Andy Grove of Intel, he's like a, I think a model for how, you know, how you should think. And and you know, and and I think America was better for having people like that. So those those are good people it's not just make the choices but you can also there are people you can read about and you can emulate what they did 
So hopefully, um, after listening to our conversation, some people will um, will go and seek some more truths that might be different to their right. own. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we have covered a lot of ground, um, and I think this was this was a really really great conversation. Um, just creating, you know, some new excitement about about open source software and and or or choices within our lives that we might not think about as much. Is there anything else that you would like to add or share with the audience? Uh, yeah, one thing, if, you know, as leaders, to the extent that people listening to this are engineering leaders, think about teaching the people that follow you. You know, everything that you did, people taught you and made it possible to reach the position you were in. Turn around and pass that teaching on to others. Uh, I think that's, part of what open source does, but I think it's true in general with technology. Give people the same chances that you had. So, um, yeah, that that would be my parting message. I, I'm not sure I do it very well, but uh, but I think it's something to think about as, uh, I, and I think it goes along with a lot of the things we've talked about today. For sure, for sure. And it, it doesn't even have to be, you know, giving them the same chance. It's uh, no. providing as much as you can and maybe... Providing as much as you can so that they can solve the problems that they face, which are not going to be the same ones that you had. Right, right. But at least, at least you know, give them that chance. Right. And let's all, all hope that uh, as humanity together, we can uh, solve all of the problems that we don't yet see the solution. Absolutely. To. I, sure. I think we live in we live in you know we live in some very strange times. But if you're looking for problems to solve, they're great. We have so many of them. The problem is just if the real issue is just which one are you going to pick? I think we've talked a lot you know about that a lot. And I yeah I and as I say that's why you know that's why I was focused on give people a tool to solve the problems that they choose to solve. For sure. Um, thank you so much for for joining us today. Um, Dearest listeners and watchers, today my guest was Robert Hodges, CEO of Altinity. Um, we had a really wonderful conversation about open source software development, and I think it went a little beyond that. Um, please share with our listeners where they can follow you or your work or the company that you lead. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in the software that we're talking about, come visit us at altinity.com. We're very helpful. And uh, maybe buy some stuff so that we can continue to support so open source software. You can also contact me on LinkedIn. Just send a connection request, especially if you say you heard this podcast, that would be wonderful. And I'll connect with you right away. And, and if you want to talk about these issues further, I, I would be delighted to. So uh, Carolina, Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure today. Thank you. Thank you. I had great fun talking to you. And I, I hope really that this conversation will um, arrive to a lot of uh, headphones and, and people might start thinking about things that they haven't maybe put so much uh, thought into. Thank you so much for joining Level Up Engineering. Thank you, Carolina. Thanks for staying with us. This was the Level Up Engineering Podcast by Apex Lab. Check them out at apexlab.io. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel, rate our content, and share your thoughts on this episode. See you next time.